Welcome to episode 57 of our series on the surnames of Appalachia and the American South. As I've mentioned a few times in other episodes of this series, these two regions are quite large. For instance, Switzerland is physically smaller than Middle Tennessee and about the same size as East Tennessee. It stands to reason that there are thousands of surnames scattered throughout our places of interest. We've only covered about 600 names so far on the vantage point, and there are 750 on my list that need to be covered. Uh, that's the biggest reason why I want to examine older pre-Civil War family names. After the Industrial Revolution, surname complexity was huge. With that information out of the way, I'm happy to tell you that on today's vantage point, we're going to pick up where we left off in episode 56 and cover eight more family names scattered throughout the South and Appalachia. I hope you'll join me. Number one, Hobbs or Hobbs. Occasionally I'm asked to cover a surname that I've never encountered in my days walking on the planet called Earth. And that includes thousands of students that I've had the great pleasure and fortune to teach. Our first name today, Hobbs, is one such family. Now, I've heard of the name Hobbs before, so I'm not completely oblivious to it. In fact, it's a featured name in one of my favorite sports or baseball movies of all time, Roy Hobbs. Doesn't that name sound about as American as apple pie and baseball? I think so. <laughs> Robert Redford thought so, too, because he played Roy in his 1984 movie, The Natural. It has a theme of unrequited love and family in it. So even if you don't like sports, especially baseball, you can find something in this movie that will speak or spark your interest. In case you're wondering, my favorite sports movie of all time is Hoosiers, followed by The Pride of the Yankees and Brian's Song. Now, what are some of yours? I'd love to know. At any rate, the surname Hobbs is an English name with deep roots on the continent where it appeared as the low German name Hobb, H-O-B-B-E. <clears throat> it was brought to the Isles by the Saxons and the Angles beginning in about the uh, 5th century. Like Hodge, Hobb was so strongly associated with the rural English peasant class that it became something of a generic term for a rustic person, a clown, or a goblin. When we place an S at the end of Hob, it means the son of Hob. Hob is a pet form of Robert. In addition to England, Hob, the Hob form, H-O-B, took root in Scotland, where it was also seen as a pet form of Robert. It doesn't appear among the traditional surnames of Ireland or Wales. I'm confident that we can call Hobbs an English name, but Hob, with a single B, is most likely Scottish. Number two, Wilcox. Wilcox or Wilcox. These three English surnames, which are really derived from places in Wiltshire, England, uh, are discussed by Henry Harrison. And he says that in its earliest form, it was most likely derived from Old English or Old Norse words for a spring or well. Wilcox, in any form, does not appear among the traditional surnames of Ireland, Scotland, or Wales. I think we can be confident that Wilcox is an English surname. Number three, Lawson. <laughs> I must admit that when I read the name Lawson on the request list, I tensed up a bit. Why might you ask? Well, <laughs> it's because the vice principal of my elementary school was Mr. Lawson and he swung a heavy paddle, if you know what I mean. Unfortunately, I had it a few times. Anyway, before Lawson arrived in America, it was associated with England, Scotland, and Ulster. That's the nine northern counties in Ireland. Law was a pet form of Lawrence. As such, it entered the Isles with the Normans in the 11th century. As you might expect, Lawson means the son of law. It's been in Scotland since the days of William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. In case you can't fix those two individuals in a, a temporal context, let me just go ahead and tell you that Lawson first appears on the Scottish records in 1296. It arrived in Ulster, Northern Ireland, in the 17th century during the Plantation Era. At the end of the day, you'll need a paper trail to determine the place of origin for your specific line of Lawson. Number four, Thomas. 
McTavish. I didn't realize they were the same name, but they are. In case you forgot your Sunday school lessons, the name Thomas entered Europe as a biblical name of one of Jesus' disciples. Thomas was so doubtful of the resurrected Jesus standing in front of him, he demanded to touch his wounds. That's right. That's the origin of the old saying, Doubting Thomas. It's a label that has been attached to skeptics, skeptics throughout the West. Thomas arrived in the Isles with the Normans, and being the mobile lot of farming soldiers that were the Normans, several of them made their ways to Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. The name Thomas was exceedingly common in medieval Wales. <clears throat> the Gaelic-speaking people of Ireland and Scotland, and the Isle of Man for that matter, morphed the Latin form of the name into McTavish, McCombe, and McThomas. Of course, there were those who adopted the simple form, Thomas. At the end of the day, you'll need a paper trail to locate the origin of your line of Thomas. But rest assured that McTavish is Scottish and McThomas is most, most often or most likely Irish. Number five, Lane. <clears throat> Let me say right off the bat that I better get this one correct. I married into the Lane family of East Tennessee nearly 20 years ago. Consequently, I've heard many speculations and stories about where their name originated. Amy says that she read that it was derived from the French name Lalane, as in Jack Lalane, the fitness guru of the 1960s here in America. In truth, there are several points of origin for Lane. I'm hesitant to cover all of them because I will likely leave out one or two. There are at least two French origins, one Anglo-Saxon origin that spread throughout the Isles, and one or two Anglicizations using Lane to replace Gaelic names or forms. Some Scottish families of Maclean or Maclean uh, may have adopted the shorter Lane to, uh, to use instead of the longer version. In England, Lane was given to a person or family that lived along a narrow road situated between hedges or fences. Clearly, you will need a paper trail to locate the origin of your specific line of Lane. Number six, Marshall. Right now, I'm thinking about Mr. and Mrs. Marshall in Dunning, Scotland. I hope they're still alive. They were my landlords when I taught American studies at the University of Dundee. It was through them that I truly understood what a country accent was in the Bonnie Land. We were in Perthshire, Scotland, the home of Kenneth McAlpin, the first king of Scotland. I asked Mrs. Marshall one day if she was English because she spoke like, well, somebody with an Oxbridge accent. She looked shocked and said, oh, heavens no, we are Scottish to the bone. They certainly didn't sound like the golf pro down at the local golf course in Dunning, or many other folks that I bumped into on a daily basis. You must play down around the Brooks to Roundaboot. That was a typical uh, accent around where I lived in Perthshire. I don't want to bore you, but I'm going to risk it. The Marshall's accent was produced in the early 1600s when James VI of Scotland inherited Elizabeth I's throne in 1603, and he moved down to London. Members of the aristocracy in Scotland followed the court to London, Westminster to be uh, precise. It was in England that they acquired the accent of Oxford and Cambridge Universities, or Oxbridge. Their surname, like many others of the gentry in Scotland, was uh, first introduced into the Isles by the Normans in the 11th century. It was a name given to a farrier or servant working with horses. Now. <laughs> Before researching it, uh, I fully expected it to be a name given to a law enforcement official like U.S. Marshal Matt Dillon. Nope, not in its original form. It's found all over Ireland as well as Great Britain. A paper trail would be most helpful in locating the origin of your line of Marshal. Number seven, Maloney, Maloney, Maloney. Oh, Baloney Maloney. <laughs> Sorry about that. I couldn't resist. The surname Maloney, like Lawson that we covered earlier, takes me back to elementary school once again. Mrs. Maloney was my fourth grade teacher. I could still see her standing in front of class with her beehive hairdo. 
It was back in the 1960s. I also remember one day when a kid named Miller was giving her a lot of grief, just talking back. He was such a bully. So I stood up to him and I said, hush, which was one of her favorite words. Leave her alone. If you're looking for trouble, you came the right place. But leave Mrs. Maloney alone. <laughs> I was glad that he didn't take me up on that challenge. Interestingly, no one recognized my bold words as a partial line from Elvis's song, Trouble, from his 1958 movie, King Creole. At any rate, the surname Maloney is of Irish origin. Here's its Gaelic form, which meant a servant of the church. Number eight, Hughes, or Hughes. When I was growing up, one of the oddest rich celebrities to grace the movie screen and aviation industry was none other than Howard Hughes. He was the Elon Musk of his day before he developed a psychological condition called obsessive compulsive disorder and a, a form of paranoia, perhaps something like agoraphobia, maybe, I don't know. At any rate, the surname Hughes has an English origin, but it's also found in Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, like several of the other names that we mentioned today. Forms of Hughes was well-traveled before reaching England, though. It originated on the continent with the Teutonic folk in the north. Hugh meant soul, mind, thought. Hughes referred to the son of Hugh. It was even found in France as as we've seen with several other names discussed today, a paper trail is needed to locate your line of hues. Well, folks, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Until I see you again, may the good Lord smile on you and yours. Bye-bye.